Welcome back to a new video for IB Environmental Systems and Society. Today's video is about topic 3.2, Origins of Biodiversity. It's going to be a quick review to help you get ready for your mock exams and those big IB ESS examinations at the end of the school year. Let's get into it. First up is that evolution is a gradual change happening over many, many generations. It is a genetic change that leads to the changes in physical appearance or the phenotype of organism driven by a process called natural selection. This is Darwin's big idea, originally published in The Origin of Species in 1859. Evolution is probably the most heavily evidenced scientific theory in history. We have thousands of of fossil examples from a wide range of species spanning several billion years showing that it's been happening. We have genetic evidence in mitochondrial DNA. We can see, we can track mutation rates across generations. We can watch evolution happening in real time, both in laboratory experiments and with things like bacterial resistance to antibiotics happening in the world's hospitals. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence in support of evolution by natural selection. One of the first rules of the process of natural selection is that there is variation within populations. And you can see variation in the patterns of this giraffe fur here. These are all different species of giraffes. And the idea is that some of the variation benefits the survival of the organism. Some of the variation harms the survival chances of the organism. Some of it has no impact. So the premise is that the variations that harm the survival of the organism tend to be filtered out because those organisms don't survive to reproduce. Whereas the characteristics that are genetically coded for that give that organism a survival advantage tend to be selected for and their frequency in the gene pool increases over time. You don't need to know the details of natural selection like you would for an IB bio class, but you do need to know this general process. If you really want to get into the details of it, you can click on this link right here. I'll drop it into the comments of the video and you can read all about evolution of the different shapes of bird beaks. The next big idea in this topic, it is actually the environment that drives the process of evolution. This isn't something that species choose to do. It is that the environment selects who, who lives and who dies. And the most classic example of this is the English peppered moth, which you can see here on the screen. In the English countryside, before the Industrial Revolution, the peppered moth liked to live in our birch trees, which have this pale gray bark. Pale gray peppered moths found it easy to be camouflaged there, and pepper moths with the darker pigmentation were more readily seen and eaten by predators. Then we started burning fossil fuels and leaving soot on everything in the countryside which covered our nice pale birch trees in a dark layer, which then meant that the lighter colored moths began to stand out against the background and the darker colored moths were more easily camouflaged. So the predators switched from eating the dark moths to eating the light moths. Again, the moths didn't choose to evolve, but the environment changed and applied a different or new environmental pressure on the moths. So there was a shift in the gene pool. This happens over many millions of years, happens over many generations. And what's going on is if the environmental pressure is great enough on one population, it will eventually become a new species because the genes will have shifted enough that that population can no longer successfully interbreed and produce fertile offspring. The most famous example of this and what really prompted Charles Darwin's thinking is the Galapagos finches. When Darwin traveled there in the mid-1800s aboard the HMS Beagle, he noticed that there were species of finches on all of the islands and that the beak shape of the birds was correlated with the type of food on each island because each island has a different set of abiotic factors and therefore different environments. The Galapagos Islands are really isolated way out in the middle of the ocean. And so this idea of adaptive radiation is that there was one original species of finch that came to the islands. And as its offspring survived, the ones who had beak shapes through their variation that were particularly adapted to finding food on certain islands gradually developed physical and behavioral differences until they became new species. So the new species adapted to new environments and radiated out from the original species. Generally speaking, speciation is driven by isolation. You will have a population of organisms that can go back and forth between two bodies of water, for example, 
when sea levels were higher. And then as the sea levels dropped and all of this land in Central America suddenly became above sea level, these populations could no longer interact and interbreed. Because that changed the movement of water in the oceans, it changed the ocean currents, the environment changed in the Caribbean compared to the Pacific. And over many generations, the porkfish split off from the panamic porkfish. These used to be one species, but after the appearance of the Central American peninsula here, these two populations were no longer able to interbreed and they eventually became totally separate species, although they are related. You'll notice they still have the same genus. You should be able to explain how plate activity has influenced evolution and biodiversity on Earth. The big ideas here are that land masses continually move around our planet over many millions and billions of years. And as they move, they might migrate from the tropical zones into the temperate areas or into polar zones. And that as they move around, migration routes change because land masses that were connected suddenly become disconnected. Land masses that were separated are then joined together. And so that changes the way that different populations of organisms interact with one another. You don't need to know the details of Earth's inner structure and be able to explain the details of tectonic forces driving the movement of Earth's plates for ESS. What you do need to know is that as those land masses move in and out of different climate zones, and as Earth's climate changes through ice ages and warm spells, that makes migration routes available for species to interact, and it breaks migration routes further isolating species, which then, of course, influences the genetic makeup of subsequent generations. Some of the evidence that we have for evolution is that we have fossil remains on land masses that are currently very far apart from the exact same time period, showing that in the past, those land masses were together. Here we have the Cynognathus reptile. Its fossils are found in South America and Africa. We have these Glossopteris ferns, whose fossils are found across all of the continents in this image. And if you can recall, Call Antarctica right now isn't really a place where you're going to find too many ferns, pri primarily covered with a big thick ice cap. The fact that we have fossils of the same species at the same time across all of these land masses shows that in the past all of these land masses were at one point connected and these species could migrate back and forth. One of the big ideas you need for ESS is to know that there have been in Earth's past what we call mass extinction events and they're indicated here by these yellow triangles. And you can see where the number of species on the planet drops very precipitously every time we have one of those mass extinction events. Why do those mass extinction events happen? Why does biodiversity fall off periodically in Earth's history? Here are the major mass extinctions that have been documented so far. Names are the timings of them. I suggest you probably remember the KT event that happened 65 million years ago, knocking out the dinosaurs. But if you look at these causes, rapid global cooling, rapid global cooling, rapid global warming, rapid global warming, all of these mass extinction events have been driven by rapid climate change. And that's one of the reasons why climate change is such a big deal today. As a matter of fact, extinction rates today have spiked in a way that they have during all five of Earth's past mass extinction events, leading many scientists to conclude that now in the time of people called the Anthropocene, we have actually entered the sixth great mass extinction event in Earth's history. That's it for our review of topic 3.2. I hope it helps you prepare for your mock exams and your final exams. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. I have other materials for all of the ESS topics at my website, www.mrcremerscience.com. I wish you the best of luck on your exams and happy learning.